I did have to take it, give me a
Chair Burke. Yeah. Yes. So, I'm serious. I haven't hired the candidates to be in this. So, I'm going to say, what? What? Here's some conventional match. Yeah. 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 Now I'm just going to We have our Zoomers here. Good. Uh, Zoomers, give me a thumbs up. Can you hear us okay? We good? Okay. Whatever. <laughs> They're bringing some more materials. Yes. Uh, I'll read it. That's the 972-646-0717. <clears throat> You might know what that is. I've oh, got this group up here. It's the mail bond, right? <laughs> it's the most common response I've got across the board new agents, old agents, experienced agents. I said, we'd have great, we'd have the panel on the agent hotline. They go, what's that? So, one of the things we want to do today is reintroduce everyone. Uh, to a very valuable resource. Um, we we put, put together a number of years ago, uh, pre-COVID and all that, uh, because we recognized that you occasionally would have quick questions. That's funny. <laughs> I'm not looking at your part, I'm not saying that, and I'm, but yeah. <laughs> Occasionally, quick questions. Um, and while those of us who are in the office, Marsh and I, most of the time, are happy uh, to answer your quick questions, happy may be too strong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, reality sometimes we're not available. And so we wanted to set up a resource uh, so that you could contact people. Get the information. So, we, who needs more copies? So, Lucy got more copies. Uh, and and so you'll see when we get in here, we talk about the uh, the time, the time frame that we have here, uh, that you can do it. But it, it's more than just having a place you can call. Raise your hand if you need a copy. Now, if you already, this is what you've already got. This is the material that's already back there. John Sue, you've got it right there. That's what we're talking about. If you don't have that, two more. Two more here. Three more. Uh, more than just a place to call somebody and ask a question. It's beginning to understand there's a process here. And uh, I have to be a little careful on those of you who have maybe sent me a text or email or even asked me uh, a question, quick question. Uh, you get a lot more than just the simple answer. You may ask and say, well, here's what paragraph 61 said. There's so many layers to it, so many variables. Uh, that one of the reasons for this resource is you've got agents, various agents, who understand all of those layers and all those variables and can help you ask questions. And, and one of the things we'll talk about here are the six questions you need to ask before you even ask hotline that'll help you uh, hone in on things. But it helps you understand because if you've been in my classes at all, you understand. I'm not a fan of memorization. I'm a fan of what? Concepts. Concepts. Understanding concepts. Right. Understanding concepts. 
if you've got the concept down, you can look at a particular situation and analyze and think your way through it. Uh, and, and that's really important. You don't have to memorize the 23 paragraphs of the Wonder Boy family. And, you know, although she just you need to understand the concepts, you need to know somewhere in there exact. And what that'll do is it'll help you feel far more confident as you interact with your client, and they will see that. It creates a credibility for you with your client that they say, you know, she or he knows this. They know that stuff. And that really makes a difference because one of the key things in every relationship you have with a client is the trust factor. They've got to trust that you know what you're doing. They've got to trust they can rely on you. That has to be there. If, they'll, if that trust will be there, it makes all the difference in the world on how you help them move through the transaction. So who else needed? Uh, <laughs> so who needs it? Yeah. Okay. So yes. Sorry. So as we work through this, um, this is intended to be very interactive. Uh, we'll have certain things that are outline agents and we'll let them each introduce themselves um, so that you have a sense of what you're talking about here. Except for Joe, we don't, don't want to know any more about Joe. We know all we need to know about Joe. He's from New York. That's it. That's it. And he knows how to make a good pizza. Yes, he does. A good pizza. Okay, see? That's how much cheese. <laughs> That's good. Uh, th this is intended to be very interactive. So you can ask questions, give examples, and go through it because you know, we learn from each other in these classes. And, it's a, and, and that makes sure that we include the Zoomers so that they have questions or something that uh, they unmute themselves and let us know. And when we have questions from some of the people in the class, be sure I remember to repeat the question so the people on Zoom can hear what the question is and hear what we're talking about there. Um, but this, this, uh, this resource, which... Uh, we, we set up uh, one, it, it was not an easy thing to set up. Um, we had to jump through a number of huge had to make some decisions about doing this because uh, there's an interesting balancing act that we have this group, me, our shell leadership, and dealing with you. We want to do everything we can support you and provide resources. But we want to be careful we don't step over the line and become enablers. So that you don't have to think about anything, you don't have to think it through, you don't have to worry about the concept, you just make phone calls. That's not helpful to you, certainly not helpful to us. So we wanted to be sure that as we're providing this resource, it doesn't get in the way of you thinking through the situation and coming up with good answers as you analyze and work through it. And you'll see as we'll get into one of the things here, <clears throat> there are some questions that we'll talk about even before you call the hotline, you need to ask these questions of yourself as you'll work through this. Um, well, let's do, I, I do want our fine panel here to introduce themselves and let's go ahead and start with Joe right here. So tell us who you are and how long you've been in the business and why you're still here, your therapy working or not. <laughs> Uh, Bill Martin's, uh, my license is 02, 1980. I've been in the business, been a broker since 1982. Been around a while. Yeah. <laughs> he's trying to catch an old law, but you know, he's, he's too far gone. Uh, my name is Scott Scrimmer. I've been in the real estate business, I think, about 28 years. So my license starts low four five. <laughs> <laughs> Marshall Levine, I've been in this office for almost 21 years, and mine is 050. Nick <laughs> McCoy, been in business, uh, yeah, 21 years now, 049. <laughs> oh, I do have a broker's license, a broker's associate, I guess. Yeah, I'm yeah. myself. Yeah, absolutely. 
Uh, and, and I'm Bob Baker, and my license is 0120. Yeah. I my broker's license in seven while I was in college. Next day, Blake. Oh, good. Thank you. Now, the, uh, what I want us to be able to do here, we're, we're going to talk about some things for uh, each of the online persons to kind of talk about some of what they've experienced, some examples. I want us to also be able to ask a question that you work through this, uh, but I also want us to make sure we go through the procedure um, because we're not just casually telling you about this. Uh, we really want to emphasize this. You really need to make use of this, uh, not because we don't want you to go to someone else like Jana, Marsha, myself, or whatever, but you need to be responsible on your own to think through these things come up with good answers and analyze them. Um, and I, I understand sometimes you're in the middle of it and it's all hot and heavy and, uh, and you just gotta have a quick answer right then. And so the Tennessee, you're gonna ask the question. I understand sometimes that happens. Uh, but some other times you've got the time to work through it yourself and deal with it and you know find a better way to do it than just ask a question as you work through it. Um, because you know we, we're we're seeing some very interesting things happening. Is that a good phrase, Marsha? Interesting things happening out there of what people are doing, uh, creative and uh, crazy, and everything in between. And and this creates a challenge on you. If you don't have a good system in place where you can work through the concepts of whatever you're dealing with. Um, it gets to be a real challenge. And one of the things that we'll talk about uh, is, is dealing with that. One of the most common questions I get is, you know, working through the process of things. And, and I'll ask us as well, what does your client want to do? And in reality, it's many, many times you haven't had that conversation with your client yet. You, you can't say, well, well, I wanted to get all the choices stuff first before I talk to my client. Well, you probably knew the choice. Let's talk through the concept of working through those. Uh, so let, let's start uh, with Nick. Um, give us a sense of some of what you're seeing uh, in some of the questions that you're getting, any trends that you find yourself dealing with. Um, because, because the concept is whenever they get a call, 90% uh, of every call they get, they can handle. Now, basically, we'll get to that next level that's a dispute or a demand or an attorney or whatever. And, and I get involved. But 90% of the stuff, they've got it. And they can handle it and they can go through the process and ask you questions to go through it. So Nick, what are you seeing out there? Um, you do see still some questions about appraisal addendums. So people are still, I think there's still some hesitancy, even though I think most, most of them know what to put. They kind of just want that double check. Yeah. Of, of making sure they would show us to the partial. Exactly. Yeah. So, and just how that adds up correctly, um, still protecting their clients, stuff like that. Um, I do get a lot of questions on. Uh, Sorry. See, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, negotiating questions. Yeah. Um, questions on on kind of strategy, which you know, there's there's not really a. I mean, obviously, there's not a form for that, but there's not a uh, a set in stone. Well, when this, this happens, when this, this happens, or this is your option, it's more of, and it's kind of talking it through. Um, so I, I do see that as it's not anything that can be specified there. I went through the, the voicemails on the helpline and, you know, have examples of what other questions they have. Um, if a contract terminates, let's, how do we make sure that it's fully terminated? Meaning. So let's just touch on that. That's a great point to talk about. Oh, um, what about our. One of our really uh, good agents um, had a transaction. She represented the seller. And her phrase was, well, it didn't close on the day it was supposed to close. 
phrase was that the contract expired. Contracts don't expire. One of the great phrases that Avis Wukaj, former chair of Texas Real Estate Commission, former chair of Texas Real Estate Realtors, broker down in Round Rock, Georgetown, very, very smart, uh, very sharp. He said, contracts don't die. They have to be killed. Action has to be taken. Uh, and to think it expired might cause you to say to your seller, we just had another great offer come in and say, oh, great. I'm done with that one. It's over. It's gone. So I'm going to do this other one. No. We've got to resolve that first one. Um, one of the little challenges I have causes me to see things in a, in a way that fortunately you don't have to see them. Um, that exact scenario uh, we dealt with, and we had what was going to be a lawsuit. There was a very strong demand letter with attorneys in which we had the seller and we moved past the closing dates. We even moved, moved past what we think of as a reasonable time, which is not a defined term. Uh, we were two weeks past closing date. Uh, our seller had, in fact, sent a default with notice to you know, cure to the first buyer. And the seller did enter into another contract against our advice. Well, the first buyer showed back up. Our seller had entered into a second contract with another buyer. And so the first buyer got an attorney and was moving forward to suing us. In that particular case, the title company also made a mistake. They should not have allowed that second contract, and they did. And so the title company, seller, and us, we all put some money together to essentially buy the second buyer out of the contract. So these things happen. So it's not theoretical. It's not happening. Well, it's got, they actually happen. And, uh, you know, it, it, any one of my big roles, what I do is to keep those demand letters and those disputes from, from becoming a lawsuit or a track plan. We had a really good year last year. It was reflected because we just renewed our errors and missions insurance. And, and, our, and our premium was actually lower than the previous year because we had zero uh, and, and because we were able to convert those demand. So when you get a demand or something like that, you send it to us and we work on it and go through the process. So these are not just hypothetical. These are things that we got to work on and deal with. As Nick points out, is deal with that concept of it. Uh, so when you have something that doesn't close uh, or your seller moves forward on something else, you've got to make sure they operate under your advice of counsel. They resolve the first one. And the easiest way to resolve the first one, if that first buyer will take it, is release earnest money to the first buyer. And sometimes the sellers are very frustrated. You say, well, they don't reserve anything. Yeah, but you want to sell the house. And here you've got another offer that's better than that one. So to move forward on that one, you really need to kill that person, you know, take care of it. And that's the easiest way to do that, even though when mostly they may not want to take. Well, and most title companies, in my experience, uh, require that form to be signed before they'll move on to anything else. So, but that's not, you can't totally rely on them to do that. You have to suggest. Yeah. What else do you have? Uh, a lot of stuff on leases, but, um, oh gosh. Uh, what, do have on, what do you have on leases? Oh, it, it's random. That's, okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I wrote it down, but I kind of just get past it because there was no way to. You know, the challenge with the leases is it's small numbers. People don't take it seriously. And yet, leases are probably measured in two of the areas with the most direct complaints. So, it, you know, we tend to not pay attention to it. You kind of work. Through. And since, in what I found is since agents don't do them regularly, they aren't as good at caring for them as they would be for a regular contract and offer. But going through the, the resale process or even new construction, I feel like they do leases even more rarely than that. And so, since there's not a lot of repetition there, there's not a lot of, hey, I gotta keep my antenna up for this situation, this situation, this situation. But, um, the other thing was backup, uh, backup contracts. Uh, I think there's some questions on timeline and procedures on how to do the money auction fee, things like that. How those work, if it terminates, if it makes, if it's made primary, how to structure splitting the option and earnest money in those situations to not tie up their clients' funds as much, things like that. 
So it's a great point, backup contracts. Uh, and I think if you've got a seller, I, I think the seller should always accept a backup. I think it's a plus for the seller as they're moving forward. Because we know all contracts don't close. Plus, it gives the seller a little bit more leverage in negotiating with this first buyer, repair and so forth. They've got a really good backup sitting there. A um, couple of things on a backup. If the seller hasn't enter, entered into a backup contract, uh, working through the process, um, you know, obviously the backup contract uh, person knows that there's a first contract. That's why they're in the backup position as you work through that. Uh, but the seller is not required to tell the buyer on the first contract that they have a backup. That's confidential. That's something that, that seller knows and their agent knows. The seller is not required to give that information up to the buyer on the first contract. They may want to hold on to it until all of a sudden use it in their negotiation and say, well, you know, I don't have to tell you this, but I think you just ought to know I'm going to back up. And frankly, it's pretty dang I'm good in comparison to year or so. If you want to keep asking me for all these repairs, just got to let you know I don't have a lot of incentive to work with you. So, so they, they can kind of hold that back and use it when they find that it's a, a good leverage in the negotiation. Um, the other thing is that we do have that track promulgated addendum, and it has the language in there talking about earnest money and options, which got in paragraph eight. But we have in our intranet, as Nick pointed out, uh, we've got the procedure for splitting up the earnest money and the option fee. So if you have the buyer on a backup contract, if the seller accepts your backup contract offer, uh, then your buyer has to pay the option fee and the earnest money right then, not later when they move into the first position that they do. Uh, now, earnest money is not a problem because if the backup contract never moves in the first position, they're going to get their earnest money back. I mean, that's an easy thing. But the option fee, whatever the buyer pays, the backup buyer pays in an option fee, they never get it back. They don't move into the first position, it's still gone. So we split it up. So if you were going to pay $200 in an option fee, you pay $10 now, and the other $190 when your backup moves to the first position. And we've got a that whole page process and internet set. Here's how you do that. Here's the example and whatever. Um, the other thing is the Trek promulgated contract for our backup addendum can only be used for the first backup addendum, for the first backup contract. Uh, I think we've got one right now. I'm trying to remember who brought it up. Um, that they've got a potential for a second uh, buyer who wants to do a backup. Uh, that's legal, but you cannot use the Trek addendum. An attorney would have to prepare that second backup contract addendum. Because the first addendum, the Trek addendum, is only good for that first backup position. So if you want to do more than that, it's going to take an attorney to do that addendum. He would make use of the Trek addendum and would make some tweaks that do it. But it's certain there's no legal limit on how many backup contracts a seller can have, uh, as long as they're all prepared to work <coughs> after that first one by attorneys as you work through that. Uh, but it's, it's valuable for you to understand. Uh, how that backup works because um, we're back in that role again, that whole mode, not as much as we did a year, year and a half ago, where we're seeing multiple offers again. And what we're seeing, um, I can think of four in this office alone, first contracts that terminated within the first week. This is happening a lot. So if you've got a buyer and they don't get that first contract, get them into a backup. There's a really good chance um, that, that you know you might move into that first position. I can tell you, in fact, you will look like a hero. Oh, give that first deal phone. <laughs> Your buyer will love you. In that. Yes, they will. Yes, they will. As they should, by the way. Now, the, the, the other thing about that is you kind of work through position. It does happen, you know, fairly often. When you're writing the offer on the backup, especially if that first contract is great, no way for us to know it, but they accept it. That's a great contract, and everybody feels really good about it. They're not going to look at your offer as seriously as they would have if it was the first one. You might get away with some terms that you couldn't have gotten away with if you were the only, only offer. 
So you can really do things for your buyer and that backup that you may not have been able to do in that first offer. So understanding that backup is, is really key to be able to. And, and you know how you understand it? Read the backup contract addendum. Uh, and, and, and by the way, and we, we've had classes on this and backup contracts with the property, uh, and we'll, we'll have some more on that. Uh, but we also, you know, going through the process, uh, we're, we're going to go ahead and put some of those things. We've got a whole, I think it's about a two page write up on backup contracts and how that works. And we'll make sure that goes into our internet and I guess into what else, what else will we put that kind of things on? So I just have access to it. Um, our YouTube channel, I, but YouTube is only for video. Yeah. We're going to start trying to do some videos if we can find somebody. Jenny. Um, yes, go ahead. Yeah, I'm not volunteering for that. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but just some other best practices, just some tips. I mean, you can ask if you're in primary and you think that it will be offer, but yours is selected. It's probably a good idea to ask the listing agent if they have a backup uh, contract. They can't tell you no if they do. They can't lie to you. But if they take something in effect of, oh, well, I um, can't tell you that. They just told you that. <laughs> so, you know, that's good information for your buyer to know. So maybe they don't ask for as much of the repairs, or maybe maybe they do. Maybe they do the mind or whatever. Anyway, um, same thing on the, on the uh, listing side. Well, so I agree with Bob to an extent that you always want backup for your seller. It's always a good idea to have a, a backup on the seller, unless you <laughs> think that it might be better to keep that open and if the first terminates to go back and get a multiple offer scenario again some sellers will like that strategy i think presenting that strategy to them the pluses and minuses of that as opposed to getting a backup locked in is a good conversation to have that's a great point depending on what's going on with your property it's a great idea good strategy yeah. um marcia what do you have uh, I have a lot of calls about what form do I use for this or for that. Just people, you know, when you don't use things all the time, every day, you just sort of forget what you're supposed to use for whatever it might be. A lot of times it's a agreement between brokers, or it could be an amendment, or it could be a usual answer, which is tell your client to seek legal counsel. <laughs> we can't answer a lot of these questions. Fortunately, there's a lot of things that come through and we're not allowed to interpret our clients and we're not allowed to answer. So a lot of times when we get to what the real question is, the answer is they need to seek legal. She just made a statement. We get to the real question. When you call, and especially when we were talking a few minutes about the six questions you need to ask yourself. When you call, we recognize at some level but you kind of decided the answer you're kind of trying to look for. In fact, one of the things we know that happens is you'll call Marcia and you don't get quite the answer you want, and then I'll get a call. I mean, and you're 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 playing that back and forth. So sometimes we have to have some conversation with you to find out what your real question actually is as you work through that. That's why if you ever call the Texas Realtor legal hotline, I get a notice from them that you've called. And so I will tend to follow up with you and make sure that I'm, that we got the answer to the question and see if we need to follow up on that because uh, the answers you'll get from the Texas Realtor Hotline is pretty generic. Because they make it very clear they don't represent us, they don't have attorney-client privilege kind of thing. So they're kind of quoting some stuff. So sometimes it's a, it's a question that uh, we need to follow up and keep going on. So you're exactly right, Marcy. Dig into the questions. Mm -hmm. I also get questions about um, <clears throat> things that are in MLS versus things that are in the contract. So people, uh, if you have the buyer, for instance, or the seller, let's do that. You have the seller and the seller tells you, I want to exclude these items and you put it in MLS and you have it in your listing agreement, but it's not in the contract and it doesn't count. So it's important to remember that just because you have it in those places, if it's not in the contract, the contract rules. Uh, sometimes you might have an instance where the commission is less than 3%, not our agents, of course, but uh, they may be offering less than 3%, and you may have put 3% on 
on the broker page. Well, I'm entitled to 3% because everybody signed the contract. It doesn't count. Whatever's in MLS is what rules, unless you do something to change that. In an agreement between brokers, for example, or you change it before an offer is presented. But all this counts, you know, the, the buyer's agent is responsible to look at MLS on the day they submit an offer to see what's there. Whatever's there, we can hold the listing broker to. Uh, but if if the listing broker has changed that offering from maybe three to two, and they did it before we submitted an offer, that's what the page. And so we should print that off the day we send an offer. So you've got offer. documentation. Now you have documentation. So if we end up in arbitration, you've got good documentation for that. So what are the other forms, Marcia, that you find yourself challenged with? Get the appraisal addendum a lot. Um, just amendments in general, verbiage, asking for verbiage. What, how do I say this? What do I need to ask for in this instance? A lot of times I'll come back with what does your client want and there is dead silence because they haven't had that conversation. It's like people want to prepare before they go to their client. And so they want to have all the scenarios kind of in their head. But when it comes down to it, we have to do whatever the client really wants us to do. And sometimes, especially when it is repairs, it can be an uncomfortable conversation with the other side. If you have the buyer and your buyer, maybe they're not an experienced buyer and they have, you know, three pages worth of repairs. You know, if they tell you, I want you to ask for every one of these, then that's what your fiduciary duty is. And you have to do that. So that can be an uncomfortable conversation and a lot of times I'll have people call and have the seller and say, you know, the buyer's agent just asked me for 16 things and I'm, we're not going to do that. And I'll say, okay, that's fine. Is that what your seller said? Silence. So a lot of times, you know, I think that it's the agents who get in the way of a lot of things and deals. So, you know, if you play nice in the beginning, I know this sounds kind of weird because we're really but <laughs> play nights in the beginning and you build that relationship with the other agent, things will go so much better. Even if something happens and the deal falls out, it's so much better than that animosity that you start out with. Because what we tend to do is we tend to push that onto our clients. That buyer's agent, what an idiot, you know, she's they're asking for all this stuff. Well, we shouldn't be doing that. We should be protecting client from a lot of that stuff. One thing I started doing, and this comes from Scott and Barbara, um, is, oh it's, it's like, we're the fiduciary. It's our responsibility to do what they want, even if we don't agree with it. So if it's something that I don't necessarily agree with what they're doing, I just simply, you know, an email, phone call, I'm just letting you know that I'm acting in the interest of my client and X, Y, Z. And it's it goes to your point, Marcia. It just, it goes a long way. Kind of a little additional on that point that the two young ladies make. The, the agents who I get the fewest phone calls from are the agents who are able to make sure they get along with the other agent. The agents are working it out together and making this thing work. I don't hear from them. They, they work through and they solve the problems they get because they've established that relationship and they all are on the same team for the clients. Uh, so your ability to do that, even, even when the other side is being a little snarky about it, and you'll have that, move right past it. You know, don't, don't return in kind. Well, you snarky, I'm going to show you how. I, I, one of my agents here since we've gone, maybe that. Um, <laughs> in my office and she's, you know what they accused me of being they accused me of being snippy they said I was a snippy 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 I said well you're snipping with me <laughs> snipping with them I mean, she does. that was part of her personality and she didn't recognize it sometimes we don't recognize the power of what we say to people how it really influences them uh, so we've got to be really careful as we work through that uh, what else Marcia you want to talk to me about the uh, uh, flood addendum? Flood addendum. Bane of my existence, the flood addendum. So because the seller's temporary residential lease changed in August, now paragraph 23 says that you know the buyer 
the landlord, which is the buyer, has to give the tenant notice about flood. Flood notice. We use a flood of dinner. This is a problem a lot of times because people don't know that. They don't know that maybe they haven't read the temporary lease lately and they don't know it changed. Or I've heard, well, I know we need it, but I just wanted to get through and get the contract executed and then we'll come back and fix it later. I hear that a lot. Um, it's just really important to come to Bob's classes and stay up on what's happening and pay attention to, you know, contracts that change, gotten some contracts, you know, the new contracts that came out, I've gotten some old ones where it was completely executed and you might've had the seller and the listing agent will say, well, the buyer, the buyer's agent did it. Well, if you let your seller sign it, then you're culpable too. It's just as much your responsibility for not catching it. So, well, and so let's talk about that floodplain addendum. We think it's going to get fixed. We think the legislature uh, and the Law Committee are going to change that. Um, what we've got in the seller temporary residential lease on the second page, uh, paragraphs 21 and paragraphs 22 um, create a waiver from the Texas Property Code because this is, and it's one of the reasons this is a temporary residential lease. It has exemptions from security device requirements and smoke detector requirements. And that language is in paragraph 21 and 22 of the seller's temporary lease. Well, paragraph 23, they didn't do that waiver. And they're requiring the landlord, who is the buyer, to provide that addendum to the seller, who is the tenant. Uh, we think that'll get changed and we'll be good with it. But right now it's there. Now, the consequences, the, the concept of it is that by giving this notice, what the notice effectively is saying to the tenant, uh, here's our information we have on, on any floods and so forth, that's on the addendum. And if flooding happens in this property and your personal property gets damaged, that's what it addresses. Most of the time, these are fairly short time frames, you know, a few days, a few weeks, something like that. Some of them are longer than that. Uh, but the challenge here, the risk here, is that if the flood happens and um, the seller uh, slash tenant's property gets damaged, then there's some culpability for the buyer. Now, we have to remember, as Marcia pointed out when we were talking, where the buyer, who is the landlord, gets the information on floodplains. They get it from the seller in the sale disclosure notice. So what, what's stupid about this is the buyer is getting this information. Thank you, seller, for this information. By the way, here it is. <laughs> just giving it right back to you. Uh, so it, it, there, there's no right in termination if the seller, if, if the buyer does not include it in the offer to make sure it's part of the contract and checks off in paragraph 22, that's all they did. If that's not done, um, even the, the few days that it's there and something happens or whatever, and the seller's property is damaged, then there's some culpability for the buyer. Uh, but that, that's, we've not had it happen. Since this was in there, we've not had anything happen. We've not had any action, not just us, but nowhere across the state I've talked to my other broker friends. Uh, it's just not happened. So it, it's it's one of those things, don't ever let it get in the way of the contract. So if you've got the seller and the seller's temporary residence lease and the buyer makes an offer and they don't include that, uh, if if you're going to counter anyway, then you might remind them to go ahead. We really need that. But if they don't provide it, there's no risk to the seller. All the risk is on the buyer side, and no risk on the buyer side is if it does end up flooding. So we're not going to, except for the aggravation that it causes for Marcia, as she said, I need that. You know, uh, there, there's no risk on our side. We certainly wouldn't keep it being a contract just because it is not is not included. Uh, and I will tell you, outside of our offices here and in Rockwall, because I've got this stuff, same stuff in Rockwall, um, of all the other companies, I would say 90% of them have no awareness of this addendum. And then it's required if you're using the temporary release. And we're, we're back seeing a lot of seller temporary releases again because of both bulk scenarios. So it's one of those things that if you do have the buyer, uh, get the information from the seller and the seller's solution notice. And, and virtually every time you say, have no knowledge, have no knowledge, no, no, as far as we know, and submit it with the offer and send the other side. Um, you know, no, no downside to doing that. Uh, if you don't end up doing it uh, and something happened, make sure you have that conversation with your buyer 
Because if you don't talk to your buyer about it and it doesn't get done and the flood hits, uh, then your buyer has some uh, culpability there and so do you. So, but other than that, you know, it's not a big deal. That actually um, reminds me of something else that's come up a few times is uh, after a contract is executed and they realize there's an addendum missing, just getting that addendum signed as opposed to that in a different way. Yeah, uh, one second, Mike. One of the things occasionally that happens is they go back into the contract and make changes. Never do that. Look at your contract as if it were laminated. Always make any change with the amendment. So to, to the next point, if you're going to add an addendum, that's item number nine on the truck promulgated amendment form, buyer and seller agree, add the attached, and then you'll have that addendum uh, so that the both parties will sign the amendment, both parties will sign the addendum, and then what you've done is you've added that to paragraph 22 of the contract. Um, and then the challenge is getting everybody to sign off on it. Everybody agree, oh yeah, yeah, we gotta do that. And what, what gets added often after the fact is the power temporary residence lease. Um, and this is most common occasionally, like there'll be some other addendum, but uh, all of a sudden they realize, yeah, we really do need to sell that other house. Because maybe it wouldn't happen to us, but some listing agents out there don't actually ask buyer's agent, does your buyer have a house to sell? That can never, ever, ever be the case when you have a listing. You can never, ever receive an offer from a buyer and not ask the buyer's agent, does your buyer have a house they need to sell? Uh, my sellers, you always got to ask them. Uh, and I will tell you, most agents don't. Ours do. Because you know, I'm, I'm, I hadn't thought about that, but you preached about it long enough, so I guess I'll start doing it. Uh, but you got to do it. You got to ask it because they don't have to tell you. They don't have to use the addendum. They don't have to tell you. That doesn't have to happen. Have to happen on any level. Uh, and it's a bad day when all of a sudden you have to tell your seller, "Oh, we're not going to be able to close because you couldn't sell their other house." But what, what what house? First, I've heard of that. What's going on here? How, how come you didn't find out about that sooner? What's what's happening? Uh, so you need to make sure you've done all that stuff way ahead of time. As we're good. Anything else, Marsha, before we go, no, Scott? No, let's just go. I, other, uh, <laughs> yes, Mike, go ahead. Other than flood water, what happens if other water, like a overflowing... That's a bigger flood as defined on that again. I know that, but as far as the people's personal articles getting damaged by other than a flood, is there anything that we need to be aware of? Yeah. Yeah. Are you so I'm not sure I'm clear on your question. My question like is... Stop, stop. Stop. My question is, everything is fine with the house. While they're in there for two weeks, the so the seller is still in the property. Yes. After closing, the seller's in the property yeah. after closing. And what happens? So we have a little overflows. It does damage to their couch and dining room set. Paragraph fourteen of the seller temporary residence lease. Seller is responsible for the property. Responsible to fix anything. Anything goes bad. So if something happens. It's the seller's responsibility and the seller's responsibility if, if something overflows, water here breaks, whatever like that, and the seller's property is damaged, that's all the seller's side of the deal. Thank you. Good as the tenant in paragraph 14. Now there's a little glitch in paragraph nine that deals with wear and tear and some other casual law, things like that. But for the most part, it's going to be totally the seller's responsibility. Well, that's the position we're going to take unless we have a seller and then we'll argue about it. Yes, ma'am. Does the seller then, though, need renter's insurance because they're leasing back at that time? The seller should have renter's, renter's insurance. Renter's insurance yeah. would handle those damages, not the seller. Yeah, time. so it's a good idea for them to do it. And in, in a normal lease situation, <laughs> yeah, most landlords uh, will require tenants to have renter's insurance. Yeah, it's a good thing. We don't really address that specifically in the seller temporary residential lease, but I think it, if, if you do have you know, the buyer is going to be the landlord and got this tenant there, then you might want to put something in special provisions of the lease requiring them to do that. Uh, so that, you know, that helps that challenge you got there. Joe, you had a follow-up on that? Or, uh, okay, Larry. I have a question for Marcia. <laughs> okay, you can stop paying attention, members, because this is between Larry and Marcia. What language look like in the amendment about a roof? to be an insurance claim to be filed and not going to happen during the operation. I will period. direct you about. 
Okay, now his question has to deal with language and deal with the roof and adjusters and reports, things like that. You'll remember in our last class, we talked about the six steps in dealing with the repair request procedures. And, and we kind of talked about that. Uh, here's 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 the crux of kind of what I, where I think you're going with this. You've got the buyer, and we've determined some way, shape, or form. Maybe the seller says self disclosure. Maybe the buyer's track inspector said, "Hey, roof thing." Maybe a roofer. And so, what you're going to do is you're going to ask the seller uh, to replace the roof. You're going to ask the seller to file a claim with the insurance company. You have a conversation about that you should receive the adjuster report. Uh, you need to make sure that language is clear. Because what happens is a buyer says, "Hey, well, I'm going to get a new roof, and the seller's insurance company is going to pay for it." Well, you better make sure that's the language that you have in the repair memo. Because if you just presume that that's the case, when the when the seller's insurance company and there's some really bad insurance companies out there, when the sellers, well, there are, you know, there are. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so when when the seller's insurance company said, "No, nope, roof's fine." It's 20 year old roofs, it's you know, wear and tear, so we're not gonna do anything. And the buyer's expecting a new roof, now we got a problem. So you need to make sure as you work with that, things like you wanna make sure you get adjusted report, but you wanna make sure if the buyer's asking the seller for a new roof, it's regardless of what their insurance company does. Now, if you've got the seller, you're doing the other side of this, you're gonna say, okay, uh, I tell you what we'll do, we'll do whatever our insurance company's willing to pay for. And if they're not willing to pay for anything, then you know what? You just bought a house with a 20 year old roof. We're not doing anything. Uh, so you've got to work through that. The key is, as we talked about in that, you know, steps of the repair mill procedure, is make sure that we are clear who's going to be making the decision, what it is specifically we're asking for, and who's going to make those decisions as you work through that. Because um, people are going to interpret these things entirely different. Everybody's got a different perspective about what something means as you. As you work through this, um, there's no way for us to presume everybody understands the exact same thing. And, and we see that more in the repair amendments than almost anything else as you work through it. Scott? I would say what I tend to get are pretty consistent with what these guys are talking about. Uh, sometimes we get this sort of mundane okay, what, how many days should I put in here? You know, see the HOA documents, those types of things. Uh, but a couple of situations fairly recently regarding uh, terminations. And uh, so I had one recently where uh, it was, we have an agent that was wanting to rescind uh, a contract uh, because the buyers decided to buy another house. And so as we dug into it, we found out that, okay, the house, they were under contract. So you can't rescind an offer that's not an offer. It's a, it's a binding contract. And as we talked through it, uh, they buyer had not tendered the option fee. And so they were wanting to just go, okay, let's go ahead and get out of this. And we don't have to pay the option fee. Well, if you don't pay the option fee, then you don't have a right to terminate. So under that provision, <laughs> under that provision, yes. Um, but I've had a couple of situations like that fairly recently. Uh, again, other ones are just the appraisal waiver, pretty much, pretty much with these guys that we're talking about. I will say just a general comment. I've been very surprised at how few calls that I do get on. <laughs> it's big in offices we have. Uh, That's because they don't know about it. Yeah, so, <laughs> you can fix today. I want everybody in here to talk to me over the next week. Your call out. It's the secrets out. Yeah, I, I, I get it. I don't. I, we we were we were all new agents, and you know what happens is it's Friday night or Saturday night, and it's eight p.m. and you're trying to get an offer in, and so here's a weekend. Yeah, and so it's you know, but but you you don't call the hotline. People will talk to their buddy who. Tells them, oh, you should do this. Yeah, yeah. And um, you know, the, the hotline is there as a resource. So I would say take advantage of it. And I, I do think kind of, you know, back to what Bob says about thinking through the process, I think the best scenario is where an agent will will read the contract, read the intent, and when they call the hotline, 
lay out the facts, but also have a solution based on my understanding. Here, here's what I think. And I think that forces us to actually you know, critically think about what we should be doing. And again, go, kind of going back to the concepts, just like in this case, great example where there was confusion about, okay, what's really the concept that you have an actual accepted contract, you can't just rescind it, that type of thing. So anyway, just- The difference between rescinding an offer, terminating a contract. Two different set of rules for offers, two different set, seven different set of rules when you're in a contract. And, and most of it is in the contract itself, but if you're not sure from a buyer's perspective, look at the correct promulgated form, buyer's notice termination contract. And it sets forth the eight areas in there that are in the pre-printed text. Now, one of the things that's important about that particular concept that Scott brings up is that your seller needs to understand when they accept an offer, they're giving up the, but these rights of termination for the buyer. And when the buyer all of a sudden terminates under the HOA or the seller's closure or, or whatever other right in there, uh, sellers say, well, can they do that? That's the wrong time to say, well, oh yeah, you didn't read the contract, did you? Uh, it's right there, it's in there. So that should have been a conversation that you should have had going through the process. <laughs> they accept an offer and they know what are the conditions under which they've accepted that offer and what can happen as you work through that. And Bob, I do think that's important for both of them. As you're working with a buyer, of course, you need to say that your, your number one out is the, is the option period, but there are other outs. Yes. Right? But you also, when you're working with your seller, you need to let them know that so that they're prepared. Question. Yes, ma'am. Regarding the uh, what do you call this new build and the new tools. Uh, new, uh, new build and what? The new builds uh -huh. and the uh, new builders and the rentals. Like somebody wants to buy a house. Maybe he wants to buy right now to live. Maybe down there, he's young. He wants to be maybe after one year he might go. Can he rent it out because you don't know restrictions. That has, yeah, if it's in a major HOA, the, the major HOA documents will tell him what he can do about rental, which you can run into a situation like that. Yeah, many HOAs have a percentage. Yes. And so it may be okay right now, but a year from now when he gets ready to rent it, they may have exceeded their percentage and he can't do it. Now, here's our challenge with major HOAs. You cannot review that H those are HOA documents that you receive under the HOA addendum and interpret them. You can't look at that 60 pages and say, well, here's what this means. You can't, they've got to do it. And they've got to call the HOA. They've got to ask questions. They've got to have an attorney do it. Uh, we cannot interpret it because they are not correct documents. You're practicing law when you start going through there and say, well, here's what this means. Here's what you're allowed to do. Here's what you're not allowed to do. You can't do that. And yet it's hard because we feel like, well, well that's what we're there for. We're there to, Advise our client, where they will help them understand. What you advise your client is, these are the conditions under which you're gonna own this property. And anytime you buy a property in a manual HOA, you've got certain restrictions that you've got to understand. If you got any questions about any of them, before you close on this thing, in fact, before you enter a contract, talk to somebody at HOA. Exactly. Talk to the people that live there, find out what they're doing. Because um, it, it's, you know, some of the restrictions are just horrible. Um, just mildly. Another thing is so. So the answer to your question is we don't know, and we can't say it or about what you say is. This is going to depend on what your HOA says. It's going to depend on what their rules are. Uh, some HOAs establish that you've got to own the property for a year before you can rent it out. So they all have different sets of rules. Some of some of these new HOAs is three to five years of ownership before you can lease. Yeah. Out. So they've got different so they've got their So you've got to make sure your client. Has looked at it, read it, understood it, and uh, and has taken ownership based on those conditions. And, okay, so it depends on each owner. But sometimes say they have a person or something. And sometimes they, what? Sometimes they said, okay, now like some members are now giving to the investors. So they will they will not change it later. Like one. See an HOA, the HOA subdivision information. All that information can be changed by the board of directors of that HOA. So, so next month, the board of directors can make a total change. They, you know, we, we were allowing 35% to 
to be, you know, investors, but we're going to change that to 20%. And overnight, it'd be a whole different ballgame. So what happened when they sell the house? Suppose five years down the line, they're selling the house. So new person has the same uh, problem that they cannot rent it out? Or we don't know. See, we are not our responsibility. If the seller, okay, hey guys, if the seller sells it later to a new owner, that new buyer is responsible for determining what that HOA will allow. We will, this is important. We get into a lot of trouble when we start representing things to other sides. We will not represent on any level Here's what the HOA will allow you, the new buyer, to do, and never have that conversation. Uh, they've got to do their own work. They've got to have their own responsibility. Their agent has to help them go through that process. Uh, when you start representing that, if you're wrong on any level, uh, not only is it liability, it's bad service to the client. I mean, it's bad service to the other side because they're trusting us. They're like, well, that's what they told us you could do. And we hear that all the time. Our, our buyer will get information from the other side. Oh, yeah, you do this, 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 this. And you're wrong as you work through that. And Sue, you got a question? Yes. Uh, so uh, I just know, um, do, do if we know the HOA with some restriction, do we need to disclose it in the MLS? If you're the listing agent? Yeah, if I'm a listing if agent. If you represent the seller and you're the listing agent and you say, well, there are some restrictions here, I think you want to be very careful putting anything like that in private remarks in my list. You may lead them to believe that's all there is. I say, oh, those are tricks. Well, other than that, I'm fine. I can do whatever, you know. No, I think you've got to be very careful. It's the responsibility of the buyer's agent to advise their buyer to work through that process to determine what they can do. Uh, it's not. Uh, and if, if, and if, for example, let's say the buyer uh, wants to put a detached garage. And it's a major HOA. Well, that's going to come under provisions of the major HOA on their own things, in addition to city covenants and setback lines. So there are all kinds of things that come into play. And the buyer in paragraph 6D of the contract objections puts in there that they want to build a detached garage. They may include a blueprint with it and the size of it and all that kind of stuff. It's still the buyer's responsibility to determine if they can do it. And if they determine to find some way they can't do it, they can object to fact they can't do this if in the big blank in paragraph 6d objections if they put in there that they want to build you know a detached garage according to the attached schematic if they find out they can't do it they've got to make that objection to the seller and the seller wants to not required and so we say well that's what i can do about that our seller just can do nothing at all on that paragraph it's totally the responsibility of the buyer and the buyer's agent to know whether or not this thing that they have put in there say, if I can't use it for this, then I can object. That's all they can do is object. It's the buyer's responsibility to determine if they can do it or not do it um, as you work through it. So you, you, I would not, representing the seller, I would not put any information in MLS saying here's some restrictions because they could be led to believe that's it. That's all there is. So when you've got 65 pages of documents, they're going to tell all the stuff that can and cannot be done. Does that make semi sense? Yes, ma'am. So, if, suppose my buyer wants to buy a debt to buy two properties from our builder. And you want to buy two houses from a builder. builder. And the builder is saying, you, are, uh, you, can, you can rent. And then, can I put over there in one line over there that the purpose is for rental? Can you can put that in paragraph 6D, but it's still the buyer's responsibility to determine who is. You build a contract. So I said, well, okay, in a new bill. If you can put that somewhere in the new bill, some new bill contracts have a special vision, some of them don't. Some of them, it's really hard for you to find a place you can put it. What you do not want to do is trust the builder that he knows what he's talking about. The buyer can say, well, I know I can use this rental because the builder said so. The builder may be an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he may be able to sell. It's just making it sell. Especially, especially, especially if it's a builder sales rep. Not the builder. I mean, he's just selling houses. Yeah. So your buyer, if your buyer says, well, that sounds good. That's a good start. So now buyer says, I'm going to check with the HOA. I'm going to check with all the restrictions. I'm going to find out what I can and cannot do uh, as it works through the process. Do not rely on what the builder says. And, and even good builders out there may believe, yeah, that's the case. And they may be wrong. So check the HOA before cycle. The buyer checks it. The buyer checks it. Correct. Uh, Barbara? Yeah, one of the, the biggest dangers, I think, is someone saying, 
We should be all right doing that. You should be all right doing that. Yeah. <laughs> we give that all the time. Yeah. It, it should be fine. Well, again, it comes back to what Bob said. You need to verify it with the source. That yeah. the way, can we do this? Yeah. And, and so, you know, this, this is something, I guess we got one of them resolved. So we have still two. Uh, one here and one in Rockwall. Uh, that involves the exact situation where the buyer thought they could do something they can't. And uh, one of them, one in Rockwall, will end up in a lawsuit. Because our agent, and this is not a brand new agent, uh, made the mistake of checking it out and finding out what could be done, and our agent was wrong. And our agent represented to the buyer, here's what, don't represent anything I've said this before. People say, Bob, ask this to you. don't know anything. <laughs> you don't know anything. Everything you know comes from somewhere else. You always cite the source. You don't know anything. You say, well, here's what it says. Here's what it says. And then let them do the research. You don't know anything. When you start representing that roof, that condition of the property, that foundation, uh, what can be done in an HOA, you're now responsible. And not only is it a liability, it's bad service to the client. The client needs to understand what they can trust you to know and do and what they cannot trust you to know and do. And, and you know, <clears throat> they used to do a lot of enormous production out there, not in our office, but in other offices, uh, doing it because they, they're selling. They're just sell, sell, selling. And they know there's certain things that take to help them. And hopefully most of the time they come back and bite them and they get a lot of sales going. Uh, we don't do that. Our, our, and somebody missed it. We have fiduciary duties to our clients. I think Marty missed it. Fiduciary duties to our clients. And that, that means that we really got to make sure that when we've got expertise, we know what we're doing, market expertise, subject matter expertise, geographic policy, all of those things to the benefit of our client. And to work through and do all that. It's, it's, a, it's a challenge. Yes, sir. Go. Is the trick probably open for the consumer or is it just for agents? Oh, it's only for agents. Oh, we well, say Trek. Okay, Trek or Texas Realtor. This is just okay. Texas Realtor is only open to realtors. Okay. In fact, when you call uh Texas or Texas Realtors, 1-800-873-9155. When you call that number, uh they'll say if you have a question for the legal hotline, press one. And what they'll ask you for is your license number. Uh, so they can verify that you are a Texas realtor. Only Texas realtors can access it. 1 800 873 9155. So that's what you call. Trek is, has a semi legal hotline. But you can call Trek as a consumer uh, or as an agent and get information. Even as involved as I am with Trek and a lot of really good people there. Including some of the people that, that answer the phones, they've gotten much, much better at doing that. And what they're doing is they're quoting you the rules. Uh, what, what we do is go beyond that. You know, we say, let's think through it, let's talk about it, let's give you some advice, let's advise you on this situation. Uh, and and Trek is very careful as to know. And even Tax and Realty very careful, say, you know, we don't have a attorney client relationship. Uh, you know, we, we're going to give you our opinion, answer to a, a legal question. Uh, one of the things I always like to do is if you call the legal hotline, the tech, the tax rule the legal hotline, make sure you get the name of the person you're talking to. I know most of the attorneys there. And so when we follow up and I talk to you, I said, okay, what was your question? What kind of answer did you get? And I'll go, I said, I know that particular attorney. And I don't think that attorney would have told you that. Let's talk about your question. Because what happens is, and you do this, you do this to us and you do it to them. You're asking a question to get the answer. You already decided you won't. And that's, that's what you're doing. So when you ask the question, what you're hearing is something to confirm what you want. And so when I find that follow up, I say, okay, so let's, let, let's forget about the sexual hotline. Let's ask me. Let's go through what you really are asking here to get a really good answer. Um, yes, sir. I, I had a question, and uh, I was told that uh, maybe you could seek uh, legal advice, legal counsel, you know. But when you tell that to the client, they always say, well, where do I start? Who do I call? Who do you know? So what kind of uh, resource can we provide? Okay, great question. Uh, of course, they will have already signed off on the administrative policy form. 
you make sure that you've explained to them, we don't recommend, we don't endorse. And this includes attorneys, lenders, title companies, inspectors, any vendors. Uh, we say, we think you should benefit from our set of experiences. Uh, we don't think we should just send you to Google and just look some names up or whatever. Um, but they do need to do their own research. Now, for attorneys, uh, we've got a list. Uh, generally, depending on what title company and what the issue is, some of the title company attorneys are very helpful. Charles Kramer, Kelly Belligan. Um, I have not yet met Sam Carter, who's legacy, so I, I presume he would also be helpful. Uh, you know, large title, you brandy. So those would be I'm going more. I'm more, yeah, for the agent. So those would be some good ones to start with. Um, if it's beyond that, then uh, we've got attorneys we've dealt with. You know, I could give you a list of three. Uh, and say, yeah, here are three attorney names. You give them a call. And when you call these people, uh, these attorneys, make sure you tell them where, where they got the name. Says, well, we got it from Joe, Kelly Flano. So they've got some sense of why they're calling. And because of the relationship, they'll probably talk to them as you work through it. Um, the nature of the issue will help us determine which attorneys would be good attorneys on the list. I've got a couple of attorneys who are board certified for construction, uh, that if it's that's the issue, that'd be somebody who would show up on the list. Uh, another attorney who's very good at HOAs, and that'd be an attorney who'd show up on that list. Uh, now, once in a while, we have someone that we're not entirely sure why they need an attorney's name, and it may be that it's the attorney's name because they might be going to take action against us. They're not going to get any charge. Some other good people there. They're not going to get any charge uh, because uh, we we don't want to give them a good attorney if he's going to represent them too. Now, frankly, most of the attorneys we have a relationship with, the very first thing you always do is is they do a, a, a conflict check to make sure they don't have any conflict with who it is they this buyer or person may want to go after, and because of the relationship, they all make sure. I'm sorry, I have to excuse myself. Again. I can't represent you not against, you know, Gallery and Plano because we've got a relationship there. They may even be on retainer probably. Uh, does that help with that, Joe? Is that kind of so when you that's okay, that's yes, ma'am. When when we tell them that they when we tell them that they need to seek legal counsel, I think it's really important that you tell your client why you're telling them that. A lot of times I feel like they feel we're just pushing them off because they don't want to answer it. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's important that they understand that, you know, we have to stay in our lane, and that's why a lot of times we can't answer their questions. So, yeah, yeah in, in the whole legal area, uh, Trek has created a new working group. Actually, they created it last year, uh, and it's called the Unauthorized Practice of Law Working Group because agents continue to do things that they were guilty of practicing law. And so kind of as a result of that, track has made us more and more aware uh, that we do need to you know, very often say to our client, you know what? You talk to an attorney, legal advice. Marsh and Wright, we need to explain to them why we're doing it. Um, it's not just a, a CYA on our part where we just covering our assets. It's, it's one of those situations that um, it's not good service to them. We don't have the authority. Um, and we need to be absolutely clear because sometimes the way I talk about things it misleads people. I am not an attorney. I have from time to time found myself talking to an attorney. And I go, wait a minute, went to college, you graduated from law school, you passed that gosh awful state bar exam, which is terrible, and you're so stupid. <laughs> we got attorneys out there who are clueless about our contract. They're really good divorce attorneys or estate attorneys, or what, but they have no idea and they give really bad advice. So that's why when we're going to give names, we need to know here's what you need help with and here's how we want to take you down that direction. Um, but but it's, it's, it's an important point, and you've got to develop a script kind of long like what Mark's talking about so that when you're sending them to an attorney or giving them some names, uh, they know that this is because we have fiduciary duties to them. We're operating at the highest level of service and providing them that information. And here's what they need to do. Uh, our, our, most of our good attorneys 
will be fine with having a conversation with them, listening to them about their circumstances, and we'll be able to tell our client, okay, um, based on what I know now, here's what I could do for you, and this is what it'll cost. Um, because if they have to do anything, sometimes like even write a letter or contact us at something like that, there's generally going to be a fee. Uh, so, you know, I tend to do that. So, uh, but they'll at least have that conversation and say, okay, here's the occasionally, depending on the nature of it, uh, they may help us out pro bono because of the relationship. And certainly, we would hope that our title company attorneys will work with us on that too. That makes semi good sense. But yeah, let them know. And, and by the way, it's not just it's not just attorneys. When you you know say, well, you ought to have a rubric come out, you know, HVAC come out, you know. You know uh, Ms. Marshall and Chad, we don't want them to feel like we're just passing the box uh, as you work through the thing. You know, we, we know we have problems with agents saying stupid things about the property and the condition of the property. You, you cannot represent the property on any level at all, but they do the other thing as they go through the process. Uh, they're so conservative. They're so careful not saying anything. Is that, you know, ah, that's, that's some kind of a roof issue. I don't know what it is. You need to call a roofer. Uh, well, maybe it is, maybe it's, but you need to have a good script to go along with that so they'll see that you're still supporting that. Now, we've delayed long enough, Joe's wisdom. <laughs> what do you think, Joe? I'm going to follow up on that. One of the reasons they made paragraph 11 so small in this newest contract is because of that, because agents wrote all kinds of things in there. But I'll, one other point I'll make on that is sometimes you have a buyer wanting to put certain things into the contract that you don't feel comfortable doing, have them send it to you in an email, then you can put it in there. Buyers and sellers could write anything they want in those contracts. We can't. And they could cross on anything they want. Again, we can't. So if you have buyers or sellers that want to make changes to the contract, have fun. That's all. So let's flesh, let's flesh this out a little bit. Joe is semi right. You really open it up. The most important part of this is we need clear written instruction from them. It could be an email saying here's what we want to do. Now, if they're putting if they're wanting to put anything in special revisions or an addendum to the contract that affects the legal rights of the parties, while they legally in Texas can do that language themselves, it's generally a bad idea. They need to have some legal advice. We need to tell them, we need to operate on advice of counsel. They don't have to do it. What we then have to follow up and say, no, no, I know exactly. I've done this before. I'm going to do this. It's not a problem. I, I tell you, I use escalation clauses all the time. Here's what we want to say. You have got to, in writing, make sure you're, you're on record that you've advised them to legal advice. They work through the process. And you also need to see this as one of the first red flags, whether or not you can continue to represent that client. Because one of the things you need to remember in the real world if they get sued, so do we. And so anything you're going to do that might affect the legal rights and moves us past that situation uh, is very risky. Uh, but you're right. Uh, they can do anything. Legally, if they, uh, as, as Tommy Thompson, somebody points out, our contracts, you know, we're in a clay, everybody gets it. Yeah, we can write them up on a napkin. Yeah. When, when a contract gets to the judge, the first thing he, the first thing he has to see is that it's in writing. Judges will, will not even rule on the world contracts for real for real estate in Texas. Got to be in writing. If it's writing, he doesn't care what format's in, as long as it's in writing and it's legible. Because the second thing a judge always does is, I need to see the meeting of the minds. If I can't see the meeting of the minds, we don't have a valid contract. Because that has to be one of the factors that's there. Uh, you can do that on a napkin. It's a bar, you know, through the process. If I fill it out, it's legible, sign it. Yeah, he, he promised to sell, he promised to buy, and here's what this is. Well, that, uh, how much more to me might you need? Sign here. Yeah, fine. Uh, and, and so you know, the, the latitude that Joe points out, the buyers and sellers have in Texas is huge. But the responsibility that we have under the TREC rules, under our license, is to make sure we advise them. Uh, we don't ever want the testimony in court to be our client says, I, I wasn't sure about that language. So my agent helped me out and said, you know, if you'll use this language, uh, then I'll go ahead and put it in there for you. You're hung out to dry. <laughs> so we want to make sure that it really is their idea and they came up with it and they want to do it. Because if it if they're saying, well, I just trust my agent and they came up with work. 
not only were we in trouble, it was a bad thing to do. Yeah. Bad service. What else? What was that thing you were talking about? Offered a contract? I, I was going to follow up on on uh, Nick's about the backup contracts. You have to realize that once that contract is signed, the buyer's option money goes by. He doesn't get it back any longer. So yeah. Backup contracts. Uh, the other question I get a lot of is when does the day start? If you sign the contract today, it's executed today. Today is zero. Tomorrow's deal, day one. Then you count off on tomorrow. Five days, seven days, ten days, whatever it is. That comes up a lot. Everybody. So what has to happen, Joe, for it to be a contract today? Everybody better sign. And, and sure, everybody sign. Does it have to be something else? You've got an extra date. You've got a date in there. Everybody signed it. Does there have to be some communication? Somebody has to communicate one side to the other. Yep. Like communication is everything. Yeah. Everybody can sign off on it, walk out the room. We don't have a contract until it's communicated. And that communication needs to be something that you, you in fact, improve. It's documented. It's something that we say, yeah. Uh, one of the, the late David Fair had a great little phrase. He said, he loves saying because. People misunderstood it. And now I had to explain. The verbal communication of the acceptance of a written offer creates a binding written contract. The verbal acceptance of a written offer creates a binding written contract. He says, what people hear is, oh, you mean we can have binding oral contracts? No. The oral communication of the acceptance of a written offer creates a binding written contract. He followed up and says, the problem is proving it up. How do you prove it? He says, so much of all this comes to enforceability. How, in fact, do you prove that this person actually verbally accepted on the project? Because if you don't have that communication, you don't have a contract. And that was my next one. In fact, this happened just last night. The agent, <clears throat> our agent has the listing. And, and the buyers, uh, with the buyers are actually agents buying his listing, and they negotiated the whole thing, communicated it back and forth, and then an offer, a second offer came in, and it's better than the original one. He said, "What should he do?" I said, "You got a contract on the first one. You really can't bring that second one into play. It could come in as a backup home, even though it wasn't. There were no signatures, but it was totally communicated." Plus, he's working with other agents. I thought it wasn't a good idea. What's your advice? So you're you're telling me that there were no signatures? They, well, you know, like everybody works verbally or okay. so emails. The concept of offering contract is a real challenge. I know. Um, and it comes down to what I just said a few minutes ago: enforceability. I cringe when agents are going this back and forth. Text, emails, back and forth, offers, counter offers. Um, generally, the courts rule that's not sufficient to be an abiding contract. You need actually signatures. Now, if it's the principals, principals in an email can commit themselves to a contract. Principals. But if it's from agents, the agents do not have the authority to bind their client to a contract. So when you've got that, what has to be communicated is you're going back and forth. And when you represent the seller and you get this last offer from the counter offer from a buyer that your seller really likes, uh, and they probably will accept, but they haven't yet signed off on everything. You need to say to the buyer's agent says, you know, based on my last conversation with my seller, this looks good. I'll present to the seller and if the seller still likes, because remember, things can change overnight. Your client can have a whole different scenario. Uh, but if my seller still likes it, and if he signs off on it, signs it, executes it, and I communicate that to you, then we have a contract. Until that happens, your buyer is free to go buy somebody else's house. My seller is free to entertain other offers. Because all we have is conversation. That's all we have. Uh, and that's, that's hard. Make sure you've got to make that judgment call about how things are going on with your client. Uh, what they can and cannot do as they work through the process. Um, different personalities, different, different ways, different abilities to analyze information, different commitments. Uh, and it's, it's much more important on the seller side than the buyer side um, because while the buyer can enter into multiple contracts to buy, seller can only sell 
one contract or one house to one buyer. We have one primary contract. We see more than one. We hope the buyers like each other and want to live together. Otherwise, we got a little problem here. Um, you know, you, you just got to work through it. Because uh, here's, here's one of the things that we often do. Buyer makes an offer, seller accepts it. Seller signs off on it. Listing agent has it, listing agent communicates to the buyer's agent. Seller done it. Seller's physically done everything they're required to do. And the listing agent uh, sends it back over to the buyer's agent. Buyer's agent's all excited. Buyer's agent takes it over to the title company. Move forward. Buyer's agent nor the listing agent paid it. As signatures, no dates. Still have a binding contract. We have a problem with the timelines. We don't know when the option period ended because we don't know when it began. As we sit right here, right now, fully a third of the contracts, actually contracts sitting in the title company don't have an effective date. Because people are negotiating back and forth, signing the offer, they're signing in, and then back and forth, back and forth, and they never went back to page eight and date, so they never did that. Uh, somebody at Tal Company finally realizes it, calls age up, and age you've got to say, okay, well, here was the effective date. Hopefully, they're on the same page, because depending on what date you finally agree to, you really impact on the buyer's option period. Um, but you still have a contract. Just because you don't have an effective date doesn't mean you don't have a contract. You still have a binding written contract. Uh, so that challenge, if it walks out, of going from offer to contract is a real challenge. Um, and I have we, we had one, got sued, got it resolved. Uh, we had the seller and our listing agent made the mistake of using the terrible word, terrible language. She's a top producer. Hey. She said to the buyer's agent, great, my seller loves that. We got a deal. But what happened one hour later? Better deal came in. And the seller couldn't and into a contract with this second deal. And the first buyer said, oh, no, I don't think so. We got a contract. Now, complications in the situation. There's always one more thing. Buyer was an attorney. Mm -hmm. Buyer's agent was an attorney. Of course, they were right for suit. And they were ready to move forward. And we had, you know, when we went through the process, had to get resolved. Because we, and our agent, I know, I should have said that. Yeah, you should you should not say anything like that because if it leads the other side to believe they're in a contract, their offer has been accepted, you've got a problem. Uh, because even though they're wrong, they weren't in contract, they were wrong. When all of a sudden attorneys start sending demand letters and work through the process, you've got to send that demand letter, copy that demand letter to our ENO insurance. So we start that file going and got that coverage in case we end up with the next step. Dana? So one thing I just instructed my coaches today is. If you're sending an offer back to the other side for final initials, I instruct in the email to that agent, go ahead and execute. If, if everything's signed, because that's how some of those get missed, is I get it back from the other side. Uh, yep. I don't, they don't have all the sometimes. Dates. They don't have anything executed. Have them signed, have initial everything. Well, no, everybody initially thinks the agent themselves doesn't execute it. So now we end up just So now it's instructing on the other side. Because their side's the last side to sign is go ahead and execute, then send me the copy. Yeah, a lot of them still want Do what? A lot of them still won't listen to you. Oh, yeah. That's okay, but they were still given it in writing that at least you're trying. Yeah. And so in those cases, I just, I, I put the execution date on it and I copy yeah. it back to them yeah. and I say, hey, here's, because it was executed today, uh, here's the date, just want to make sure, and we're doing this on the title as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah, follow up. Um, well, just something that we're seeing in the coaching program is, you know, a lot of our great new agents speak many different languages. And so when we're working with foreign buyers, that are out of country and they're asking their agents here, just go find us deals. Yeah. Number one, we have we don't know what that means. Number two, we don't have anything other than Spanish, I believe, or the contracts. Vietnamese. For, for illustration. For illustration purposes only. Yeah. 
effort to be able to explain to all these different yeah. languages what the contract reads and or how it even translates. Yeah. In Texas, what do you say? All contracts have to be in English to be binding contracts. Any documents recording public records have to be in English. You also have a document in another language. You have to have the English uh, equivalent that's recorded along with it. Um, and that's just the law in Texas. So, so how do we fully explain our English to whatever language yeah, is So here, here's something that you really need to understand. Because the buyer can't sign it if he doesn't understand yeah. it. Here, here's a huge part of your job. Several here. Um, not me. Not you. Find you today. Yeah. <laughs> Although sometimes your language is. <laughs> um, so here's our challenge. Uh, you have limitations that you can do, but your client trusts you to understand their language, what they're saying. Many of your clients in other languages cannot read our documents. They cannot read the English document. Now, we have through Netris, we have some other language. We have Vietnamese, we have some other languages. We have documents through Netris and some other languages. Um, and that's expanding a little bit. But they're trusting you. And what you've got to do at the same time you take care of them and service them is help them understand your limitations. And what you've got to somehow find are interpreters aside from you such as an attorney who speaks the language or someone else in Delta speaks the language can help, you know, work through the process so that they can come up with uh, a better understanding because, you know, if they're trusting you to know the market, we will find a good deal for them to work through the process. Uh, and when they're signing off on those documents that you send them, DocuSign, uh, they don't know what it means. They truly can't read it. They don't understand it. So they just trust you when you send us, okay, here's where you sign, 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 sign. And they do it and they think they bought a house and they go through the process, whatever it is. Uh, it's harder. You've got a higher level of responsibility when you're dealing with any client who is not fluent in reading English. Uh, it's more than just being able to understand, you know, verbally, but reading it because they've got to understand that document. Um, and it's, it's a challenge. Uh, imagine if some of you, it's fairly recent, but when you went through uh, your courses to, to get your license. What if you didn't have anything in writing and everything you learned was just what the instructor said? Think how hard that would be. Well, look what your clients deal with. And that's a challenge. You work through it. So you've got to be able to work through that at a level that uh, really helps you understand it. Um, so that, that is a challenge. Yes, ma'am, question. Yeah, uh, you've got my point. Right now, I find, yeah, I, I kind of have a lot of situations like that. The client because they don't they don't understand English, so they always say, "Okay, I trust you. Help me sign." Whereas don't say that. So right now I figured out the one the other part. I find out the one about translation app, and then they they're really good. They can just take a photo and all page translate to Chinese. So the whole. See if you've got that, where they can now read it for illustration purposes, and they've got a better understanding of it. Now, one of the things that you know, and they probably know, is that you don't have a word for word translation from one language to another. Right? And it's the concepts that we've talked about. So if they understand the concepts of what they're doing. Uh, fortunately, as you look through it, some of the big blanks like the price, closing date, things like that, you've got some others in there. But if you've got the ability to find through apps in today's technology world, I mean, I'm glad so you were providing it the box, for, for illustration purposes making sure that, that they're working through that, but that the final contract they're going to sign is going to be an English. And they need to recognize, they need to accept that responsibility because we can't get around that. Because I don't want to talk to them. You know, take that life. You can't, because you, now, the direct contracts, if you're fluent in their language, uh, you can read through the direct contract, read it in English, and then translate the concept to them. Of what's in the track contract because it's a track contract. You have the right, right to tr interpret a track contract and say, uh, here's the concept of what this means, recognizing there are going to be some limitations even on concepts. You're going to have to say, well, what this really means is uh, so, so you got to make some judgment calls here. But if you're fluent in that language as you work through that, 
uh, yeah, you can really do that. Um, and in fact, that's probably a, a real plus as you work through. You're able to do that. Janet? And then on the end, the buyer goes ahead and signs the contract in English. Turns out later they don't like something that was in there. Is the liability on the agent or is it because that individual well, chose to sign okay. the contract? Janet just brings up a really good point that says, Bob, we need a new form. If you seriously, if you have a client who does not read or understand English and you're going to help them with the language, uh, we'll need a form in which we advise them uh, there's not a word for word translation, even in concepts, and they are accepting the limitation of what we can do for them. And that if later they find a problem on this contract form they're signing, uh, that they indemnify us, that they accept that, that, you know, we couldn't do anything about it. They accept that limitation. So I'm going to have to work on the language for that. But I think for our clients, uh, our agents who have clients who have that challenge, um, I think we need them to accept our limitations of what we can or cannot do for them, how that works. I think it's a, that's a really, that's a good thing we need to do. Yeah, so so this is an ADA thing about dealing with disabilities. Uh, as long as we have advanced notice, uh, have an interpreter, yeah. Uh, for almost every language except New York. I mean, yeah, who you knows that? I mean, yeah. Okay, now I want us to go. You've got a page here that has the six questions on it. So I and, and I think our, our four panel persons up here. Yes, sir. Nick has to follow up. Well, one of the questions on there was um, are, are these documents and handouts available online anywhere? Or what? Yeah. What? What documents? Oh, yes. Yeah. 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 Online. Sure. So right top says hotline question procedures and it tells you the number to call. And you've got on this thing here, it talks about how it all works. Call hotline and you go through the process. Uh, is there a follow-up on a procedure of what you guys normally find that when they call? And is it normal that if they call, they'll get you first off and be able yes. to talk to me? If I'm there, yes. Yeah. So if, if they aren't able to get you, what's the process of leaving a message and email or getting back? It's that procedure. Well, allowed for right? Yeah. If somebody doesn't pick up, it goes to a message that goes out. Or the outgoing message tells them the procedure. And they can still leave a message on that. So if you call and you don't get someone, it'll send you to voicemail, voicemail, which will tell you the procedure for you leaving a message and someone getting back to you. And and a transcription of that voicemail and a link for us to listen to it will come and I disperse those to whoever's on call. Okay. Doesn't doesn't use the the voice doesn't look at the that's, 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 that's why the link is there so you can listen to it. Okay. But the okay. thing is, when you do leave a message. Make sure you're around to receive the call back. And that's what I find. You know, you call back and nobody picks up at the other end. You know, it's it drives you crazy. Then. I they got a question. I try, to, I try to text and say, hey, this is Nick, because I'm calling from a different number than what they're calling. Right. So say, hey, this is Nick. I'm, I'm gonna now get time to call you back from the hotline. Okay, so let's look at the, uh, the hotline questions. You got six questions down here. The concept of these questions is ask yourself these questions before you call the hotline. This will make your question for the hotline better. And it will help us be able to answer you as you go through the process. So uh, Nick, tell me why question number one is valuable. <laughs> uh, our advice changes. Yeah. Depending on who you represent. You guys have gotten really good at that. Almost every time when you walk in say, okay, Bob, I represent the seller, and then you ask a question. Occasionally, you don't do that. So, my first reply back to you is who we represent, buyer or seller? Because it does. Depending on who we represent, our answer will change as you work through it. So, 
uh, significant. So, Marcia, what about question number two? Well, for in a contract, it's legally binding, not us, us clients. It's legally binding versus an offer is just still a back and forth type of conversation. So the different set of rules. Remember, in an offer, nothing in an offer can require anyone to do anything. And only the parties to the contract can be required to do anything. So the buyer could say something in the offer, and you know they could say, you know, we want you to do da 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 da, and you're not required to do it. Uh, you know, confidentiality, for example, you're required to treat the offer confidentially. No, I'm not. Just asking me to do it doesn't do it. That doesn't make it work. So the rules on offers are entirely different than contracts. Because uh, when we talked earlier, you can rescind an offer, you can't rescind a contract, you have to terminate a contract or whatever you want to do. So, uh, Scott, number three, what do you think? Well, uh, so I think you just have to ask yourself, um, what, what is the question I'm trying to ask? And is it something that's already addressed in writing in a contract or an addendum? Because a lot of times you already have the answer. Uh, it you just have to figure out where it is. So, uh, but sometimes it's, it's it's not addressed in the contract, and then it's more of a procedure, or a strategy, that type of thing. But but always 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 go to the contract. Uh, we learned that from Bob. What does the contract say? Like, it's like, hey, 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 hey. <laughs> so always go to the contract first. Always go to the addendum first. Then read exactly the sentence because. 75% of the time, your question is already answered. So a good example of a procedural question, uh, dealing with the offering process or anything like that, uh, but also a listing. You're, you're on a listing presentation, you take a listing, uh, and your seller wants to change some things in the listing agreement. That's a procedure. Now, our policy is on a listing agreement on the last page, you get to sign that for us. You have that authority to do it, provided you've not changed any of the text or you haven't put something really funky in special provisions. If, there, if your seller has changed some things in there, that's a procedure question and you need to call out and say, okay, here's what he changed. He changed this part, this paragraph, changed this, that, or whatever. Maybe he took the protection period out or, or, or whatever he might have, might have done. Uh, so... If it makes a change or something like that, then those changes have to be approved by us. Uh, you, you can't, you can no longer just sign off on it because it's not the standard text of what we've agreed to uh, as you work through it. Um, and, and depending on the nature of whatever it is, there's some paragraphs in there that frankly, I could care less. In fact, they take some paragraphs out that really were to their advantage and they wanted to do it. And we see this a lot with attorney sellers and high dollar sellers who go through that process and they, you know, want to, um, but, but that's, you know, it's just, you got to take that next step. Now we can, on our side, we can insert things in special visions. We can line through things. These are not trick forms. These are text filter forms and we can do it. We can even create language because we are one of the principles to this agreement. We're a party to the agreement. So because we're a broker and then a client, we can accept those changes, we can do it, but you have to go through the process, call the hotline, say, here's what the seller wants to do. And, you know, is that okay? Is that not okay? And what do we want to do? Um, so that, that would be a procedural thing to do though, is that okay? Now, as you kind of pointed out, please read the contract. Please read the document. Now, as, as big a fan as I am for the language, as you know, I spent six years working on the language on the track contract. I think they're good, but I also own up to the fact that there are sometimes language that there's so many possible interpretations that you've read it, you looked at it, you still have questions. That's a good question to ask. And, and let us know that you've read it. You've gone through and said, okay, I've read paragraph 60 seven times, and I still don't know what it means. What what is that, you know, following user act? I'm not sure I understand what that means. So uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, this is for the track. Uh, contract. What happened to the builders? They have separate. Can we change the buyer or seller? Think anything in the in the builders? Okay, so in dealing with builder contracts, which is 
unless the builder agrees to use one of the two trick builder contracts, and they can do that if you've got to. They're most of the time, they're going to use their own contract. Yes, uh, the buyer still has that legal ability to change any language in any contract you're in, too. It's going to be harder to do with the builder. He says, you know what? Here's the deal. Take it or no. If you don't, next. Oh, well, here. Um, so it's, it's hard to do, but they can't. Remember, builder contracts are one of the most dangerous, hardest things we do because we cannot advise our client on what the contract says. We cannot advise our client on what the builder's contract says. You know, we can see there's a financing paragraph. We can see there's an inspection paragraph. You see a blank in there. But when you look through some of them, you say, you know what? You really need to have an attorney look at this. Here's a paragraph. I'm not going to advise you. It'd be legal advice. Basically, it looks to me like the builder says, uh, if we still feel good when closing day comes in, we want to still sell it to you, we might. Yes, we had a chance a year and a half ago. We had a couple of builders that effectively had paragraphs in there that said that because the prices were increasing so much that if you didn't do exactly what, what they wanted you to do, you're gone. Here's your money back. Sell it for 100000 more and next buyer. So builder contracts are really hard, and, and we got to help our buyer understand that. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Like, what? what? He sent, sent me the builder's uh, contract to me. And there was something in funny. I didn't I don't talk to your lawyer. He didn't she call the builder. He said, it's fine. So he believed it. I mean, what do I do with that? So if, if a buyer does that, if a buyer says, uh, he's telling the talk to the attorney, they don't do it. They talk to the builder. The builder says, yeah, here's what that means. And it's okay. They make the decision. Send your client an email. I understand that you've talked to the builder. Here's what the builder has interpreted and told you. You've decided to believe that. If it moves forward and that's not what it is, you've accepted the risk. You need them to acknowledge an email, which you advise them of the risk, because it is risk. Uh, anytime you're trusting any seller, but particularly a builder or an insurance seller, to do what they said they're going to do, that's a huge risk. Because, you know, not only sometimes do they change their mind, sometimes they didn't understand. That's what they really thought you understood. Sometimes they just say, all right, lie about it. That's just how it is. You say, buyers, sir, liars, well, so are sellers. And so are the agents and the other companies, but not us. So, uh, so yeah, so, so everybody good with three? Read it. Make sure you understand it. Uh, Joe, four. What do you think? Four. Well, sometimes we get a call that they don't know what form to use, so we have to assist them with that. But and walk through all the finding out what's going on, you can tell them what the form to use. But the most important thing about for as Scott just said, if you have the question and you read the document, you know which document to use and you read it, you're going to answer your question 99% of the time. You don't need to call us. But you know, sometimes you're not comfortable and you call us and we tell you, yeah, go in these blanks or whatever. And that's it. But really, if you read these documents, they pretty much are self-explanatory. And, you, and you're right. If you do that, um, it really changes how it changes your question. Uh, I had an agent because I mean, we talked about this in previous classes, um, and she came to me, came to the door, and uh, said, "Bob, I had a question for you." But on the way, on the way to see you, another agent asked me that same question. And guess what? I knew the answer. <laughs> and so I didn't need to ask you because if you think about the question and go through and analyze it, you'll find out you know, you already know the answer. And so when you go through that and you finally get you on the hotline, you're going to find that, hey, it's a better question for you. It helps us as we come forward on the answer as we work through. Um, and then uh, question number five, I'll, I'll do that. If this is a procedure question, have you clarified what your client wants to do? Now, I understand that before you start to guide your client on something, you want to understand some things a little bit better. So okay, I just wanted to make sure that I understood all the options that my client might have if they want to terminate the contract or amend the contract or ask the seller to or ask the buyer to release earnest money to extend the contract. I, I understand. I just want to understand all the options before I talk to my client. Um, and I understand that. But what you really got to understand is you probably know because of your interaction with your client, unless it's just a really quick interaction and you've only worked together for a couple of days, you may not know, but most of the time you know 
uh, what your client's going to do. And by the way, it, it doesn't help me. It's not a good answer. We say, well, I just want to buy the house. Well, that's not a good answer. Let's talk about how we're going to do that. Let's talk about what our challenges are as you kind of work through that. Uh, but if you've got a question, say, well, you know, and say, well, my, my buyer wants to extend the closing date uh, because they can't get financing by the closing date. So what do I do? That's a procedural question. So if you're a buyer, if, if you've got a closing and it's supposed to close this Friday, the 19th, and your buyer says, you know, I, I guess financing issues, and so we need to extend the closing date. Uh, and if you call the hotline and say, so my buyer wants to extend the closing date, what do I do? It's not a good question. First of all, we know we have a track promulgated amendment form. Item number three is extension of closing date. So one, that's how you do it. Second is, what's behind it? Why does the buyer need to change the closing date? Uh, and here's a, that several layers of variables as you work through this. Um, if this is the third or fourth time your buyer has done this, uh, you better have a really good story. Uh, part of it may be that you're going to have to get your buyer's lender to talk to the seller. <clears throat> Hey, this is a great buyer, and here's what's happening. It's all technical. There's no problem. You know, we got done on time tonight, and here's just the little thing that has to be done. Maybe it's even something that the seller has to do to make this thing finally happen. Uh, but, but you know the actual process. is that you need to know the stuff behind it. When your buyer needs to do something like extend the close date, you should have the big picture. Uh, is this a vacant property, so possession is not a real big issue here? Or this is a situation where the seller is... Uh, are moving out this weekend, expecting to get the money to be able to move to New Jersey or whatever like that. And so if those are the circumstances, you're then you've got to work through the process with your buyer, different situation. So you need to look at what's really going on uh, as to how you're going to advise it. And you know that. You already know vacant property occupied when the seller's moving out. The seller's going to be there for another 30 days in temporary lease. So Possession is not an issue. So all we're working on now is the timing of the money for the seller, the timing of the money for the buyer. And if you've got a buyer, and the most common reason for buyers have to extend closing is financing. If you've got a buyer in that situation, make sure you had a really good conversation with the buyer's lender on what's going on here. Because if we keep hearing one more time and one more time, and I say, oh yeah, oh yeah, I'll maybe see one more, one more, one more. Some more time sales that, you know what? No, not reasonable anymore. Uh, we're ready to move on. So you kind of work through that. Um, why in the world, question number six, why do we need to know who the other agent is, who the lender is, the title company inspector? Why do we need to know all that? Know how much to drink. <laughs> <laughs> there are a couple answers to this. One, when, when, and, and you need to work on this. Just frankly, as great as you guys are, you're not good at this. When you come in to see me and you've got a question or situation, uh, depending on what's going on, very often early in it, I'll ask you, is it what title company we dealing with? More importantly, who's the agent on the other side? Remax. Well, which Remax? I need that information. Now, why do I need that information? It makes a huge difference, Arthur. Because you may have a relationship. I may have a relationship. Uh, I just had one happen, and uh, the agent on the other side uh, was with Remax, Remax DFW. Uh, I know his manager really well. So we're together. Uh, we'll have a good conversation moving forward. This is your future. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So hopefully, hopefully we got this worked out. We got the minimum. We got to say, okay, good. Because uh, it does make a difference knowing who it is. Now, I will tell you, and I'm not going to name it. This is a recording may go on YouTube or something. Uh, there is one brokerage out there, it's small brokerage, fortunately, that it will not be any help at all. That I'm involved because the broker in that little company has actually sued me in relationship to a code of ethics violation that I said on the panel, and we ruled against him, and he accused me of bias and sued me. Uh, we've got a terrible relationship, so me being involved, my name coming up will not help. Yes, I see. Uh, oh, I can't tell you. I can't give a name. So when you ask, that's why when you bring me a situation and I ask who it is, that's why. That's when we're we'll gonna have that conversation. I say, oh, oops, can't help with that. Sorry, but but it is. Do I? I say when we tell them, they will know. Well, I will tell you, but I will tell you when you come, but I won't tell you here because it's recorded. But you know what? This is the kind of 
What was interesting the the chase, the this, 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 was, this guy was a scary moment. When we went to deposition in this lawsuit, and fortunately, because it was a protection realtor, Russell Sanders, many all that stuff, uh, they actually were a friend of the court, and they actually, one of the tech broker attorneys represented me going through the process. Well, in the deposition, uh, he, he asked me if I ever in class made a statement about how I have a general tendency to be anti-authority. And I do. I've had that statement. I've made that. What scared me is he knew something I said in a class. I don't know whether it happened to be a coincidence that one of his agents happened to be in one of my classes and I didn't know about it, but that was a little scary that he had that kind of information in that lawsuit. I said, wow. hmm. it's kind of sneaky. It's kind of... But we need to know. You know, title company, you know, lender, inspector, we need to know all that. It really helps us answering the question going to the and, and, and to the final point is, just like they can help you because when you've got a hotline question, uh, they may have just had it. Maybe I just had that same thing last week. So they're in a better position to work it. Same thing in my case. If you bring me something, I said, wow, I just dealt with that. We just would do that. Uh, something that, that we haven't had here, but I've had, I just, we just had our fourth one in, in Rockwall, fraudulent sellers. All four are dealing with acreage. We do, some, we do quite a bit of acreage out of the Rockwall office. Fraudulent sellers. Uh, one of them actually went all the way to a contract for it finally recognizing what the private portion did before closing. Uh, so we're seeing that. So if you get into any farming ranch and on acreage deals like that, uh, be extraordinarily careful. Call me because we've got some real red flags that we're working through and, and dealing with kind of that situation. But it's worked through it. So please, please, please. In fact, if you have to make something up, do it. Call the hotline. <laughs> Tim earned your big bucks. Yeah, work on the work. weekends. <laughs> any, final, any final good questions that uh, Zoomers have or that you have for our fund? And, and I, say, I really appreciate Tim taking time out of their business. Let's give them a break. Thank you. You last minute good question. Zoomers, do you have anything? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Shirley, what you got? Speaking of uh, Zoomers and recorded recordings of your classes, are all your classes usually on uh, YouTube? It's Zoom and it's recorded. It's Zoom and it's recorded. How can they access it? Uh, it's on our YouTube channel. On YouTube? So we record all of them. Okay, perfect. That last one I did on procedures, you need to on that, deal with the experiment procedures, is really important. Can I see? Yeah. Yes, good question. Quick question. Uh, yeah. uh, the, the, the rental property. The, 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 and thank you all. So let's say it was a thousand dollars security deposit, and of course, behind some window, she sent time. Okay, I'm sorry. You got to stop it, Jan. Exactly what he was doing on the security deposit before he sent back. Anyways, that's a good The 30 days can change if that tenant doesn't give you an address. No, don't give a foreign address. Right. You can send it to him. But, but it, you know what? It took three guys to eat with her. It's good to send certified. It's three of us. It's good to send certified. This way, he's always covering all the base. Like if he's giving nothing back. I'm just trying to rack up points. If he's that big, then he should send all the documents in certified mail. This way, he knows they have 30 days. Okay.